Uh, we now have a session on political participation of disabled people in Ireland. Uh, and some good news is that we have a, an additional ISL interpreter who has just joined us. So welcome to Shannon and thank you very much for uh, coming along at such short notice. But that does mean that our entire afternoon session will have ISL interpretation. Um, our session now is being chaired by Senator Tom Clonan who uh, is a retired army officer, a university lecturer, and recently elected independent senator from the Trinity College Dublin panel. Uh, Tom has campaigned uh, during his career to end gender-based discrimination and gender-based violence in the Irish Armed Forces, and he was a member of the Higher Education Authority Expert Group on Ending Bullying, Bullying, Sexual Violence and Sexual Harassment in Irish Universities. He's also written two best-selling books about his experiences in the Army in the Middle East and the former Yugoslavia. He has four children and he is an advocate for children and young adults with disabilities. Um, and there are four panel members joining Tom for this discussion and given his Army background, uh, he's going to be even more ruthless than me on time, so you have been warned. Over to you, Tom. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so, um, I'm hoping you can hear me on this microphone, which is great. So, this panel, first of all, may I thank the National Disability Authority for inviting me to speak. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great privilege, particularly with this panel of very, very distinguished speakers and people who uh, I'm really looking forward to hear their views. Um, and I want to thank you all as well for coming along, and I met a lot of people there during the lunch break a lot of uh, familiar faces and old friends, so great to be here and great to see everybody there in the audience. Um, so the title of this session is Political Participation of Disabled People in Ireland. And, and really this is a, you know, it's a red line issue. It's a, a very, very important issue. And um, so my experience of disability comes through our family and my son, who has a rare disease, Pelizaeus Merzbacher disease. So in our journey, I, I never was part of a, a community of support, like for example, let's say for argument's sake, Down Syndrome Ireland or Cerebral Palsy Ireland. So we, we were walking on a unitary journey. And since I got elected, um, and I'm elected on the Trinity panel, Trinity graduates don't make contact with me at all. They don't write to me, they don't, but people from our community do. And I have learned in the last year that the politics within our community is absolutely razor sharp. And I mean that both literally and metaphorically. It is a very, very uh, dynamic space. It's very, very hotly contested. There, there, there are so many uh, different perspectives and views and shared interests and competing interests. So actually, I think as, as, a, as a cohort in our community, there is no better qualified group of citizens than disabled citizens and their families to enter the political space and really kick it out of the ballpark. So, you know, I would say politicians from outside of our community, you know, watch out, because this is a space that is going to be absolutely dominated, I think, in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years by people from our community. That's my hope. So look, I've been asked to introduce the speakers in strict order as set out here on the paper. Um, and because of the, the we, we, we've gone a little ahead in term, terms of the timetable, each speaker is being asked to speak for six minutes. And uh, I'll give them a gentle reminder at five, although they can see a monitor here in front of them. And then we'll open it up for a Q&A and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a lively exchange of views. So thanks very much. And I'm going to first, well, I'll just introduce everybody first, and then I'll, int I'll introduce our first speaker, which will be John Dolan. So John Dolan, sitting here, is the CEO of the Disability Federation of Ireland, and uh, a former senator, and a great colleague, great mentor, and uh, sitting closest to me here is barrister Lorraine Lally. And Lorraine will be our final speaker, based on the order of the of speaking. Next to uh, John, we have Brian Sheehan, and he is the CEO of Women for Election. And then, last but not least, we have Dr. James Casey, policy officer of the Independent Living Movement of Ireland, and he's also a very good film critic, 
we had a great chat about Napoleon on our way up here. And uh, so without any further ado, I'll invite John to take the floor and to speak first. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. And our here, look here for the afternoon. Tom was saying he's looking forward to hearing us. Clearly, though, once we don't pass six minutes after that, he doesn't want to hear from us anymore. Look, um, the delighted, absolutely delighted to be here, and I think a lot of the different contributions this morning, you can thread through them. And um, the last one that we've had actually leads very, very nicely uh, into this one, the, from the community and look, participation in. Look, the high point of political participation in Ireland is to be a member of the Shannon or, 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 or uh, the Dáil. Um, the, at the same time, this goes back to one of the speakers, at the same time there are 31 local authorities and there's five or six different electoral areas within each of them. There's loads of scope, loads of scope for people um, to, 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 to get involved. People do not live in this department, that department, or the other department. They live in a local authority area. They live in a community, and that's where they need to be able to have a life uh, that, 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 that's dignified and has worth to it. Um, last Friday, I attended the launch of the Wicklow Disability Inclusion Strategy. Uh, Councillor Miriam Murphy, a wheelchair user from Arklow and in her third term, was instrumental in bringing about this uh, development. She had the support of DFI and the Council. Uh, and the Council made uh, funding available for uh, a part-time post. Point here is simply this. There were a number of critical supports available to her. Or she, well, she was the first one. A councillor with a disability with the bit between her teeth. She, this was her issue. And the way you've heard they talk about uh, Kildare, that's the kind of woman, and Michael knows her and others probably know her well, um, that's the kind of woman she is. Head down, go for it, people need to engage. Uh, a member of the management team that was fully committed to it. And then coming through DFI and support from the council, somebody there... Uh, two, three days a week to actually um, make the wheels turn and work with her and whatever. That's the only local authority right now that has a disability inclusion strategy. And I just want to click in with the, it, it, and, 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 and pick up with the County Kildare Access Network, and it's brilliant that that just came in before lunchtime. Um, so that also is the precursor. And I, I say to Kildare and all the others, now go for it, now go for it. Uh, in, 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 in terms of um, getting people out there and supporting them. Um, disabled people have the right and should have the operation to be involved in what I will call mainstream politics, which is to include disability but beyond a, a single focus on it. So there's a couple of sides to this. Very quickly to mention the European Parliament elections coming up and you have uh, that's on the agenda. Otherwise, DFI led a 13-strong delegation, and Adrian was one of the people on that. There was nearly 60 people looked to be on that delegate, delegation. We debated the draft European Disability Forum manifesto before we went out. We were part of that engagement. And all that group, plus the rest who, who, who didn't get to go, um, are committed to working. All people with disabilities of every shade and colour around the country and committed to getting involved uh, in the run-up to the local elections and we don't want to stop at 59, any other people that are interested. Um, Non-political, non-elected participation is another really important area. And there again we had a sweet example from Susie this morning and I had totally forgotten about this. They, there are a whole range of boards, public boards, you get on to the, and there'll be someone talking about that later on. So you get on, you put your name in the ring, set yourself up and see what happens. So that is a really critical area as well, and it's a place where people can, as I'd say, cut their teeth. But one of the other 13, Finton Bray, that was with us, um, he got himself elected to the committee of 15 in Fianna Fáil, the executive committee of Fianna Fáil. There are a number of political parties, nearly most of them have a disability policy or act, uh, activity group. So there, just, there are ways. 
Can I just move then quickly? There are a number of um, ways, um, a, a couple of things need to happen. More disa disabled folk need to see it as a realistic possibility for them and, a, and that it's a rightful and comfortable space and role uh, to actually get stuck into. And secondly, supports and resources um, are, are needed. The state has a role here, but so do um, so many disability organisations. I was going to um, put in a piece there about some of my own observations and thoughts from having been in the Shannon. This paper in its full iteration is available to you and I'm happy to talk to people. Let me make just quickly a couple of observations. Um, the, my approach in the Shannon was to focus on getting a, a, a substantive change made, which was get the goddamn convention ratified and then to push on and get there to be an Oireachtas committee, which is a disability, because then there is the next base from which people can, can continue to fight from a better, um, from a better, um, um, from a better standing. I'm going into injury time, and uh, forgive me for a second, Tom. Um, as a public representative, you are putting yourself and this isn't to put people off, but it is about being realistic and being prepared. You're putting yourself under public scrutiny. Everything you do and say is seen by others. It's televised a lot of it in the Oireachtas, and people can watch in on local authority meetings and whatever. So, and that's becoming more intense and it's becoming nastier as well. But um, that's something for people to think about. I'm I want to go back and I'll just say two things. Number one, yeah, the, the Susie's presentation, that look at public bodies as a way. Um, and the Kildare story, that's about making a local community accessible. And somebody, in a democracy, everything you do that's public is political. Everything. Tidy towns, being in the G, it's all the public realm. These are all great places to hone your skills, make contacts, networks, and most of the people who finish up in local authorities and in the Dáil and Senate have been involved in public activities. I'm way over, over time, delighted to be here and, and, with you, and happy to, uh, for people to come back if they have thoughts on the paper I've written and whatever. Um, more than happy to have that engagement and if people want to connect about some, some of the stuff and election work we're doing and whatever. Absolutely delightful. Well done, and thanks again to the NDA. Sorry, Tom. Uh, thanks very much, John. So uh, I would just li like to invite now uh, Dr. James Casey from Independent Living Movement of Ireland to, to speak. And you, you have six minutes I, 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 and I'll a keep, bit of injury keep time. It to six minutes. I can see it there glowing at me like Darth Vader. Um, thanks very much. It was great to hear John. And, and thanks very much, folks, for... for uh, I'm not, I'm, and, you know, fair play to John. He was the first senator in the, in, in, in the, the Rockless with who was a disabled person. So I don't, I'm not a politician. So um, I, I, I suppose... Look, we're talking about the CRPD. It's the big zeitgeist of our era, and, and it's, it's through policy now. And, and the CRPD, the Convention of the Rights of, of Disabled People, at the heart of that is disabled people, and it's about representation, it's about authentic representation, it's about agency. And, and, that, and that's going to take a paradigm shift moving from one to the other. We have, oh, look, at, I have it here, wow. We have, um, we have, we have a pot of position paper on enabled participation, supporting the involvement of disabled people in party politics. There's some up there if you collect your code. And I'm not going to go on about it, but because you can read it itself there. Like one, one of the things that we were looking at in, in, in a DPO, um, and we work through things collectively. That's how we do stuff. We, we, we collectively gather people's perspectives. We, push them together in a policy position paper and put that forward, and that's how we do things. So for us, it's, 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 very, it's very important. It's, it's one of our core values is to create that agency, that collective voice. Um, and I think it's important to kind of recognise the difference between having, having an impairment and just being a disabled person and being a disabled person with that collective representation voice going forward, because then it becomes... 
you, you have the weight of that on your shoulders. You have that weight of experience, you have the weight of opinions, the weight of perspectives, and, and that lived experience going forward. When, when I'm doing these things, I always kind of want, I always think to myself, geez, I'm not speaking for me, I'm speaking for the people that I'm listening to, the people from around the country and, and our members and, and the collective. And that becomes, a, 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 I suppose, a burden, as John was saying, it is a burden in your life as in the public realm. But it's also something very lovely about that too, because disabled people have not been given that agency um, for various reasons, and I think there's, there's, there's many ways we can talk about that. Um, one of the things that we're definitely asked, we think is, is, is appropriate is that there should be a Taoiseach's nomination for a senator. If you look what happened with Senator Flynn, I think Flynn, she, she done fantastic work with the traveller movement for that. So, a, you know, a senator's nomination for somebody who has connections to activism or DPOs and, and, and can go with that constituency, that would be a lovely thing to see, and I can't see why not. If we're looking at the CRPD as part of government policy and the new, the new way and the new paradigm of looking at disability, then we need to start looking at it like that and acting like that and not just put these lovely terms on it and move forward with that. I, I, I was very, very, very lucky to, to go away for the summer to the States and I, I got to present on behalf of Irish Civil Society to Ireland's Voluntary National Review of the United Nations. And it struck me that we have a very politically active country here compared to other countries in the world, and there's a lot of issues going on there, but we're, we're very politi politically active, and that, I think that's important because people drive policy. It has to be people that drive policy. These are the things that are directly affecting us. That's not just a sound bite, although I did think it up. It is important that if these things are going to affect us, then it has to be us that shape it, and us that are consulted in it. And how you do that is through political participation. Um, there is groups in different political parties. Every political party, I'm sure, has a disability group, whether it's Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Sinn Féin, whatever. Um, but again, these, these policies need to be driven by disabled people who are going to be affected by it. Authentic representation is important because when you have authentic representation and agency in, 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 in consequence of that, it becomes easier to get a pure sense of data and to get a pure sense of feeling that you're involved in the decision-making process. Rather than just being consulted and say, that's grand, no, lovely, you're grand. We'll get that disabled lad over there to do a little bit on that. That's not necessarily fair on the disabled person or it's fair on the process itself, agency. Um, we have Brian here from, from, from um, Women for Election and, and that's an important thing because they will always consult women about elections. You know, they're not going to consult pre -America. You know, so that, this is the thing, is that you have to consult disabled people when it comes to the political process. And in fact, that means that people feel like they own the political process and they feel like they've become part of the political process. Um, but then there's also the logistical issues too. I mean, well, you know, are, 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 are political parties, are they going to be held in accessible venues? Are they upstairs in a pub? If you have a personal assistant, if you're looking to have one, are they allowed to work at weekends? Are they allowed to go canvassing with you? Um, I know Ethan Young from Scotland is going to talk about the, the, the process they have there. The, for little fund. There should be a fund if people want to go for elections here to support them. Um, as I was saying, it's, it's a local level. All politics are local to an extent. Um, but I certainly think that disabled people, no, I don't think, I know disabled people are, are certainly not represented in the political aspect at, at the moment as, as disabled people. I know Tom's doing great work as well. And that's very important. You know, DPOs, and I'm very strong about DPOs because, you know, we talk to unions, we talk about workers' rights. We don't go up to, to you know, Finbar and say, come here, hey, what do you reckon? Do you want to get a load of money? Oh, oh, tell, us about, tell us about the truck driving policy and then we'll have a transport uh, policy with them. No, you, you talk to the unions, the unions are the ones who negotiate. DPOs bring that collective voice to the space. Um, and they're not new, they've been knocking around for 35 years. I think that's very important to have that space as well. So, yeah, I mean, um, I think there's a lot to do, but I think also there's a willingness, the CRPD is there, use it, get your head around it, start thinking about disability not as an issue of impairment and, and you know, um, to be taken care of, but it's more an issue of uh, societal adaptation to it. So, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Spot on. Am I going over there, Tom, am I? No? I've got 10, 11 seconds. I could talk about Napoleon if you want. <laughs> okay. Well, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So thanks a million. I appreciate that. And thank you for the, for the NDA for having me here. Thanks very much for that, James. That was 
very uh, thought provoking and it's great for the conversation we're going to have afterwards in the Q&A, uh, which I think hopefully will be lively and provocative. Um, so next to speak on the order here is Brian Sheehan, CEO of Women for Election. Brian. Thank you, Tom. Um, there was 10 seconds left. I'm bagsing those 10 seconds from James. Um, so look, again, delighted to be here. I'll try not to repeat what John and James have said already, and tough luck, Lorraine, if I'm saying stealing your thunder. I'm hoping that some of the things we do around women for election have parallels in terms of disabled people accessing politics. Um, politics is fascinating. I love it. Most of us here love it. As Tom says, most of um, so many disabled people are involved in politics. It's a unique opportunity to go and shape the world around us, not just on disability issues, but on all the other issues that affect us on our daily lives. However, politics in Ireland does not reflect the disability, or sorry, does not reflect the diversity of people it represents. 50% of the population are women. If that was the case and our politics represents it, we'd have 80 women TDs that are 37. That makes it 23%, which makes us 101st country in the world like risible in terms of proportion of women who are involved in political decision making. Uh, we have 949 councillors. Again, if women, if our politics at local level represented us, there'd be 414 councillors. There's about 237. It's always hard to make out about co-options. In context of people with disabilities, you'd have 35 TDs and 208 disabled counsellors. However, we don't know, and I think that might be another job for Art, wherever he is, um, sorry Art, it is some kind of demographic analysis of the people running for elections, their experiences, and the people who are elected in some way or other. Um, the intersection of gender and disability means that there are the, the kind of experience and imbalance, uh, sorry, the imbalance of power and the experience of discrimination is even more acute. It's a core principle of representative democracy that all sections of the public have equal rights and opportunities to participate in political decision making, both as citizens and as representatives. But people with disabilities are underrepresented, so too will the issues unique to them and the voice of those who can speak to those specific experiences are missing. Legislation and policy are poorer for the absence of that lens. Empowering disabled people to be part of political decision making makes for better decisions and more effective outcomes for all of us in all aspects of our lives. We can't claim to be a truly progressive democracy which I think we think we are, unless we challenge the barriers that prevent disabled people, and especially disabled women, from being politically active and, and getting elected. Uh, there's a standard five Cs that apply to the barriers that women face running for election. Cash, care, confidence, culture, and candidate selection. You might nowadays add cyber, and you might also say, because they don't begin with C, I didn't put them up, we're in a misogynistic and sexist culture that we know impacts on daily and women's lives and certainly on their, their public, which John talked about on being a public person. Um, but those five Cs and others apply to disabled women as well. In Women for Election, we work to tackle those barriers. We run wide-ranging programs uh, to inspire, encourage, and equip women to run for election. We directly support councils to shape programs targeting women in their areas to, to enter politics. Um, and I suppose one of the things that's happened most effectively for women's participation at the moment is the gender quota. Okay, happened in 2012 after a whole uh, lot of campaigning over many years. If they don't reach 30% then, 40% in the next general election, parties lose 50% of their state funding. The quota system has challenged parties to develop a culture and a selection process that will encourage women to come forward for election. And all parties are improving their processes even as we go into the local elections and it's brilliant to see it. There is no quota for local elections yet. Okay. In Women for Election, we recognise that there's a particular journey that women often go through uh, to be involved in politics, whether that's supporting a political party, supporting another person's campaign, hopefully a woman's campaign, or running as a candidate. It includes um, things that uh, James and John have mentioned, membership of a political party, of a disability group within a political party, but also uh, the, the process of getting engaged in elections per se and then using that as a route to figure out do I ever want to run for election myself or not, which I think is the key bit. And 
crucially, it's investment from government that has enabled that to happen. So organizations like ourselves, when for election she see her elected that works in rural Ireland, more so in the Northwest, those organizations, the two of us and others, including councils, are getting money from government to address the absence of women at our political decision makings. There are models there to be followed for disabled people as well. We know there's also additional barriers. Oh my God, 50 seconds. There are additional barriers for P uh, disabled people uh, running for election. And, and I want to name them that they come out in the research. Attitudinal and cultural perceptions created by stigma and prejudice, physical and practical barriers, caring responsibilities, the biggest one, financial costs, um, and structural inequalities in education, in employment, and in, and in income are huge factors that impact on a, a person uh, running for election, a disabled person running for election. And however, there are loads of ways to address that, right? Um, what I want to talk about, uh, well, you have those. Um, I want to talk a little bit just in the seven seconds plus 10 that I'm going to talk about the uh, things that could be done, right? Um, building on James's work, John's work and others, including what Vivian was talking about this morning, um, there are things that have worked in other jurisdictions and it parallels with the investment the state is making into ensuring there is more women at all political decision-making tables. And I think there's a number of those. Like for my own organisation, it is about greater engagement with DPOs to understand, articulate and advocate for greater um, measures or measures to ensure greater participation. And I'll take that away. For political parties, there's a lot of awareness raising, knowledge building uh, to make politics themselves more accessible. As James said, physically uh, to make sure the party meetings and social events are accessible, to challenge negative perceptions among party members, like the double discrimination of being a woman and being a disabled person can have a huge impact both in the confidence that other members of your party have in supporting you, and obviously then in terms of how you go out as a woman to campaign for election. Financial supports for people with disabilities, and how can campaigning methods be reshaped? Like we, we go knocking on doors, that's what happens in Ireland, but surely we can come up with different ways or added ways in which uh, uh, make it all more accessible. The biggest thing is a pipeline. It takes a while, it takes women longer than men to get in to stand up in front of an electoral, as John says, to become a public person. So, so there's a, a long journey there and I'd suggest start getting involved now. Uh, Political parties get exchequer funding. They could use some of that exchequer funding, hopefully get more of it, to specifically focus uh, on disabled people's access to politics. And I think one of the big things that keeps coming up when you talk to candidates is that there's a team, that they're, they're, they will need extra people and that the party should be providing that team, not the disabled person having to recruit it. Uh, two minutes. Uh, government, well, well actually government first, yeah, quotas. Okay, quotas in local elections that would look at uh, gender and disability and diversity and a lot of other grounds. There's a lots of movement going on of that with the National uh, Women's Council. Um, increased exchequer funding for parties that would be specifically uh, targeted at people with disabilities that um, uh, political parties have to spend in that area. An election fund, um, James has talked about it, there's very good examples in Scotland and England, it seems to have disappeared in England, it's not in Scotland, where you actually, you know, the sums reign from a couple hundred pounds to I think maybe 10 or 20,000 uh, pounds sterling to help a person uh, run for election recognising the additional burdens that are faced by uh, disabled people and then target interventions like a women for election for disabled people, okay? Uh, for councils and parliaments, there's an outreach, uh, mentoring, all those kind of things that we know from loads of other sectors we can apply here. And for the Electoral Commission, I talked about, oh, I've done. The, for the Electoral Commission, we talked about demography, but the research and everything they're doing is great. A and I think two last things for, for DPOs. I think it's about shaping the strategy of a DPO organization to say, not only will we work at engaging in politics, we'll work at putting our people into politics. It's a deeper level of engagement. I think it could be part of both funding applications, but also part of a strategic approach in organizations. And I think there's a space about targeting voters, campaigns to address some negative perceptions that being a woman or being a person uh, or being a disabled person somehow or other makes you, uh, creates a negative perception of whether you can do the job. Women get that all the time. Uh, and then the very, very last thing, um, 
we run lots and lots and lots of courses. God bless COVID in a way, because it means we can run them online. They're very accessible now in ways that they never were before. If you or any woman you know is, is vaguely interested in running for election, please talk to us. Please do it now rather than later. We'll send you out details of all the courses we run. We've lots running to the end of November. But, oh, four minutes. But mostly, um, what? I'm stopping. Um, but, and finally, just think about it. Look at the women in your life who you think should be in making decisions and encourage them to at least engage us. Hello at Women for Election or any political party. Thank you very much. And, and just to echo what Brian Machine was saying, I mean, looking at what's happening in the world today, polycrisis, conflict in Gaza, conflict in, in Ukraine, the, the climate challenge, I actually believe that the, the only way we're going to survive as a species is through the empowerment of girls and women. So it's not just something that we, we should encourage. We absolutely need this, or we're going to completely fail as a society and as, as a species unless we do that. And now, you mentioned stealing Lorraine's thunder, Brian. But anybody who knows any barrister, and particularly Lorraine, and anybody who's ever been cross-examined knows that they're not, that your thunder has not been, nor will it be stolen. So last but not least, uh, Lorraine Lally, Barrister of Law. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. For those of you online, um, I'm delighted to be here today. I am very, very passionate about voting. And my passion for voting actually started with a government decision that went back to CSPE, so Civil, Social and Political Education. I was the first class in the country the year I came in. We did that. So hello, Miss Hussey in Dominican College, Taylor Cell Galway. You did a great job. You inspired all of us to use our vote and use our voice. And I was just going to say that when I thought of the title for today, Political Participation, I find this fascinating because I think life is politics, life is conflict, life is this constant, I suppose, debate for all of us. And as I look around the room today, I work a lot with young people, and I often say to them, who is the most important person in the room? And they usually point to me, and I say to them, no, 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 you are the most important person, the most important person in the room is you. You are the most important person in the room. And very often I'm dealing with vulnerable children who don't have a voice don't have someone to talk for them. And I say to them, no, you matter. You're important. We want to hear from you. And that is what participation is, when it is genuine. But the problem for people with disabilities is we get the tokenistic participation. We get the, Lorraine, will you come on a panel and talk about this or talk about that? And then I say, well, what happened from that? Where, where did this go? Where are we getting with things? How are they developing? Because currently in Ireland, we have very, very low participation at elections. Some of our referendum, we didn't even get 50% of the population. More people buy a lotto ticket in this country every week than vote. That's the honest to God truth. Nobody seems to be talking about it. And I find it slightly shocking that I think for some of the political parties, they could definitely be doing more. Those gender quotas are suggested, suggested, Michal Martin, Leo Varadkar and Eamon Ryan. You can do better. You can actually encourage your party to open up its meetings, put your meetings online, and most importantly for people with disabilities, make it free and make it flexible, for the love of God. Not all of us are sitting around doing nothing every day. A lot of people with disabilities are caring, they're working. The most recent research shows 70% of people with disabilities are actually caring for somebody as well. We do great work and we are not getting recognised for it. So I'm saying to the government, if you want political participation, you need to engage with us. You need to actually bring us to the table and actually give us some power to make decisions, make us, give us power to make recommendations. And, you know, there is great work happening. There is really exciting stuff happening here. So for everyone here today, we all know somebody with a disability. We all love somebody with a disability. I would encourage you to tell them, make sure they vote, make sure they use their vote, but it's about participation. Write to your TDs, sign petitions, harass them to the TDs and senators who may be watching this. Some of them actually asked me not to write to them anymore. I, I have your names, by the way. One person didn't get re-elected last time. <coughs> ended, up, ended up becoming a senator nominated by the Taoiseach. We're not going to talk about it, but anyway, uh, it was interesting because I was told by that particular man that issues around women's health issues and menstruation and per 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 like po period poverty and stuff for women in wheelchairs and access to toilets and stuff apparently doesn't concern him. Not sure why not. Does he realise where he came from? <laughs> so again, I, I do wonder where... <laughs> 
I, I do find myself looking at them at times thinking, what are we doing? And when I was 21 years of age, I had the, the, the distinct privilege to spend a summer working for what we call the Venetian Partnership for Social Justice. The Venetian Partnership for Social Justice work on the ground. They have a voter education program. And I think the website is vote.ie. But I was 21 years of age, going into Sean McDermott Street. This girl from Connemara, going into Sean McDermott Street in the flats. <laughs> to this day, I'm convinced the nuns are the reason I got in and out safely. But we were knocking on doors, and I was up on the third floor of one of the flats, and a woman came to the door in a wheelchair. And I said to her, we're bringing around the voter registration forms. Can, do you want me to assist you to fill in the voter registration form? She said to me, there's no point. I'm in a wheelchair, sweetheart. Who's going to bring me down to vote? How am I going to get down? There's no lift. The last time I got out of this flat was a year ago. So she looked at me, I looked at her, I said, well, can I come in and have a cup of tea? I said, anyway, I would fill in the form and I'll help you do it. And this is back when we had pens and paper for the younger people in the room. Um, so, yeah, we used to use black pens the nuns gave us. And, and uh, I filled in the form with her because, again, she was illiterate. She'd been born disabled. She didn't know how to read, didn't know how to write. But she had been given a sewing machine. She was actually mending curtains on the table with the Singer sewing machine that my grandmother had. And I was laughing. I said to her, you're doing a great job. And she said, like, that's what they did. They taught her how to sew, and that was going to be her job. That was going to be her livelihood. And that was it. And we do still have this happening in Ireland today. So I think when it comes to the whole voter reform issues, we need to start looking at who is registered. Why aren't people registering? People in direct provision can vote in the local elections. A very smart, very intelligent politician went busing people from DP centres <laughs> in an election, which I thought was very bright. Uh, it shows you, again, engagement. So and I heard talk there about double discrimination. We're looking at triple, quadruple, five times discrimination. So you're looking at children who have a traveller mother and a migrant father who have a disability as well. We're dealing with people with a lot of different issues happening. And what we need to do is have a human rights-based approach and a human approach. And we need to be telling young people, register to vote. And you can register to vote from the age of 17, which I didn't know until last week, which is very interesting. So we need to get all the young people out there to register to vote. We need to get everyone out to actually use their voice. And please do harass the, the elected representatives by email. I'm not suggesting anything else, but email communication. and. Uh, Letter writing petitions, and you can do public petitions to the doll. And I would suggest that you look at Iraq this TV as well and watch the stuff that's happening in the debates and the discussions. A lot of these uh, politicians, when you ask them, can you ask a parliamentary question for me? Can you raise this issue? Can you do that? You don't need to pay them. You just need to send them an email. And the lovely parliamentary assistant will ring you up and go, Lorraine, can you explain this to me now? What exactly is the problem? <laughs> so again, they're learning all the time. Politicians don't get trained for their job. They don't get educated. And later on in my life, when I was doing work with the uh, Citizens Information Service, shout out to everyone in Galway and Dunleary and all that trained me, uh, I ended up going to the Dáil to train some of the TDs on social welfare, housing, medical arts. They didn't know. And one of them was a junior minister. And I spent eight hours educating him. And he was looking at me going, those forms are insane. I said, I know. We know, we're aware. So again, things are changing, things are improving all the time, and I would really come away from today with um, one thing, which is get out there, get active, get politically active, and for the love of God, in the next elections, question people on these issues, and ask other people to run. Ask a woman you know to run, a woman who's on the GAA committee, or a woman who is on the parents committee in the school. There are lots of women and lots of people with disabilities involved all over the community that aren't being asked to run. And they're not being asked to run because they, don't, they know they won't get the support. But I will support you. Other people will support you. Please do it. And for those in the room today, including Susie Wern, I'd love to see you in the local election. So, do I'm telling you now, I'm asking you, I want you all to run. Please do run. And please check out See Her Elected. I'm a graduate of See Her Elected myself. All their courses are free and they're online and it's completely flexible. And they have women in Galway and all over the country with disabilities who are running in the local elections next year. So we are delighted. And uh, we're going to continue to recruit everywhere. We don't care what political party you're a part of. We don't care what your beliefs are, anything. Stand up, be heard, use your voice. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was, that was very, very powerful. And I think, you know, everybody in this room, everyone in our community, because of the advocacy de facto that we have to undertake to get the most basic of services and supports. But, you know, it makes us politicians. 
and we're involved in, in political acts all of our lives. Uh, you know, and I reflect on, you know, what everybody's been saying here. Like, I'm not a representative for disabled people or disabled citizens. I am the independent senator on the Trinity panel. That's it, simple as. I have a range of interests. But the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities mandates me, mandates me, demands as a parent and as a carer to speak out and advocate on the issues that impact on our community. So in all the different ways and all of the different, you know, everything from force majeure to force of circumstances and all of the intersectional ways in which we all find ourselves in this same space, what I think will be very, very powerful in the future is unity and a coalition amongst our community. It could, I believe it is the most powerful voice in Irish society, but it is silent, nascent, but you listen. You listen to Lorraine there and you hear the voice of the future and what's coming next. And we are going to rock their world. It has already started and I hope that that process continues. And it will be a fundamental human rights-based approach. It'll be a radical approach, it'll be noisy, and it'll be in everyone's face. That's what I hope. Now, so to open it up to a Q&A, which I think is the most uh, important part of the, of the afternoon, do we, do we have any questions for any of our panel members? So we have a gentleman here in the blue. Uh, thank you for the speakers. Uh, Quick question I had. So you guys have achieved so much and you've come so much adversity. Um, my question is, how do you deal with people who always seem to, you ever notice people always seem to underestimate you? Like, you know how much you've accomplished, they always feel like, oh, you're doing such a good job kind of attitude. It's, you know, how do you deal with that? Uh, like, do you use to your advantage or like, what do you do about that? Lorraine, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, I. I found this very interesting because the, the panel that where they were talking about going on at state board, I recently joined the board of the, the NDA, the National Disability Authority, but I'm speaking today in my own personal capacity. But when I was going for that, I helped um, 12 other disabled women apply to go onto the board of the NDA. Um, through the public jobs, I set up emails for some of them who are visually impaired, and I couldn't understand how they chose me. And I remember going back to the women saying to them, some of them have been doing it for 50 years, 70 years. They have been advocating for me and for other women like me with disabilities. And I think, I always think of the people who aren't in the room. So anytime I get underestimated, I look around and I say, where are the, for example, the 200,000 Polish people in Ireland? Is there any Polish people in the room? Or people who are in prison right now with disabilities? We have a lot of people in Ireland who are unseen and unheard, and they're the people I think of. So when they underestimate me, I look back at them, and I think about the people who are actually not here, and not here today. Like, where's the older people? Where are the people over 80? Like, where's the younger people under 16? So when you look around the room, I look around and I say, this is not all of my island. And I, I do it for the rest of the community, more of a sense of civil duty and, and active citizenship. I believe in that. I love my country so much. And that's what always sustains me. Anytime I feel like giving up and that's it, I think, no, actually, I love my country. I love this island. And I know Ireland can do better. I know Irish people are the best in the world and they can do anything. <laughs> Thanks for that, Lorraine. Um, does anybody answer on the, on the John? Yeah, well, um, and it's, it's Coleman. It's, it's Coleman, isn't it? Uh, yes, like the master. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of mo Coleman? Coleman. All right. Coleman. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Good man. Um, sometimes I know people underestimate me, and some of them uh, want that to be true. <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there are others who underestimate me, and they're delighted when I work above that. There are others who overestimate me, and there are times when they're right to overestimate me, but on, a, on another occasion, they may not be, because I, I, I might be at my best, or I, or I might be Ugh, at certain times. But in all of that, I think, Coleman, the most important thing is you drag yourself up, you put your clobber on, put a face on, and you go out to do what you think as best you can. And whether people value it or not, should I should avoid that being the, my compass. It, it's about, uh, am I doing, am I working to what I'm supposed to be working to? And, and in, in this, it is making people with disabilities and their families who are struggling 
how are they going to be in a better place? And, and that's a short, that's a different way of saying CRPD implementation. How can people be somewhat better? So I think it is try and forget about whether you're above or below and just um, keep your eye on what your mission is. That, that's what seems to work. I think that's what works for me. Here, here. Here, here. Well said. Um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, actually, yeah, that's. And, and to all our panel. So um, I'll take one brief question, one final brief question, just we are at the very envelope of our time allotment. So do we have somebody there? Oh, very good. Thank you. And your Hello. name is? Uh, name is uh, Mick Keegan. I'm from Labour Disability. I'm Mick. Uh, 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 and I'm a, I'm a, like John, I'm a polio survivor. <laughs> good man, Mick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in 2009, I stood in the local elections using a wheelchair. I had great dif difficulty getting around. I also had people saying to me, was I well enough to stand in the election? You know, uh, and at that, I still managed to get 1,250 first person votes, you know. But the, the big thing I want to say is that if people are running disabled people are running in an election, they need this, this support to level the, the field so that they can compete with those, I'll say, able-bodied persons. And that may need money to get a PA or get somebody to give them a hand. And it's like everybody, you know, with disability, they have to fight for everything. Mm. We shouldn't have to fight to be able to... Uh, stand in, in, in an election. We should be given the tools to be able to do that without having to fight. Because you, you, when you have a disability, sometimes you get really down when you have to fight all the time, mm. you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. But that is the main thing, that we need... Every person with disability needs that level pitch. It might be only small, it could be big. I'll, I'll tell you, we have, in the next local elections in Cabra Glass, Nevin, we have a councillor running who is blind, he will need the support, mm. being able to get him around uh, uh, to do his uh, cams and whatnot. Mm. And that's where he'll need that support. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mick. I, su I suppose if we, could, if we could round out on that, just to give the final word to the panel, a number of you mentioned very practical supports like uh, funding, uh, the extension of PA supports for people who entered the political space. Is there anything else we could or should be doing? Well, if you're if you're talking about if you're talking about having a fight when you're when you're a disabled person, look, it's not for lack of money in this country. I mean, the point is that unique to, to, to Ireland and Europe, Ireland has a huge disability industry which is very well funded, but that's separate to disabled people. Unfortunately, the two then get mixed together in the public eye, and that's not a conversation we're having at many spaces. So, like Mick was saying, you have to fight for a PA, you have to fight for these things. Because again, it comes down to representation at that very level. And I keep saying that term gaslight, and I love it that it came into term, but there is this idea of, well, do, are you getting authentic representation? I mean, when a political party wants to talk about women's issues, they will go to the National Women's Council, they will, they will talk from that. Again, you, you have to have, you have to have people driving policy. I keep saying it again and again and again. I'm mixed saying, I don't, I don't get down when I, when I see a fight. I say, Joe, because I'm a working class lad. I don't want to talk too much about my background, but I grew up in the 80s. My old man worked for the shoot the train and, you know, you grow up and you have to, you have to fight because that's what you do. You either fight or you don't fight. And I think that when it comes to disability, this is the big issue that haven't dealt with in this country. I think we're dealing with quite well. Look, there is issues in LGBT and, and women's rights. There is issues there, but in the whole, they haven't been dealt with. And I think that conversation hasn't happened yet where we're talking about whether it's political representation, uh, participation or authentic representation. Like Mick was saying, you shouldn't have to fight for that. Like the, the space is there for you. It's there for you, but you have to think, you know, when power and money are involved in anything, then that's where there is a fight. But you have to remember, too, anytime anything changes, it's when it's done collectively. Individuals might start something, but it's collectively voices are heard, whether that's the referendum on LGBT marriage, whether that's the women's health weather referendum, whether it's, I don't know, whatever referendum you want. It's collective democracy that works. And that's what happened. And that goes back, and I keep saying the idea of DPOs, because, you know, we're talking about the CRPD. The CRPD talks about the importance of disabled persons organisations. 
we can't have individual, if individual ones we feed in, they're fine, they're here. But, you know, it's gone to the point now we've moved on as a society, let's have a mature conversation about this and use that. So, yes, everything is a fight, there is practical things we can do, but they all start from the very start of people being consulted at that very authentic representation and then giving them agency. So it comes back to values. So human rights model is great. I think it's brilliant. But when we talk about the social model, it comes into that too. They're, they're one and the other, you know, and, and framing it as that. Um, and that's a conversation that I think, I think we're going to have. And like Tom said, it is happening. I mean, we've been doing it for five years now around the country. We see, we see the kind of caption, that kind of anger. But also people are saying things can change. They've seen a change in the two referendums. They're saying, hold on here now a second. If this can change, what else can change? Here, here. So I think it's coming. Yeah. Finally, John, did you want to? Yeah, very big. Uh, pick up on a word as James used there. Collectivity, unity, discipline in the ranks. Anyone can run. There's no problem in running. What you want is people getting over the line. And that takes discipline. It takes connectivity. It takes unity. And people really have to concentrate on that. There's, not an or There's so many organisations across the disability spectrum. We can re-tag them one way or another, but they all have assets they can bring to this. They can get people to polling stations. They know people. They can encourage people. We have to use them all. We have to use civil society. And then we have an electoral commission. We have lots of different public bodies. There's, we have to bring all of those into it in a disciplined way and go for it. Otherwise, uh, we're going to miss what we're on the cusp of as a really good opportunity. We're at a point where we can move it on. We're at a point where we can mess it up. We won't. We'll get it right. And, you know, it'll be a better republic for everybody. Lorraine. Just make three really quick suggestions. One would be an equality and diversity fund so that there is funding available for people with disabilities. The second thing I would say is the USI, the Union of Students of Ireland, when you see the student elections in my university in Galway, you see diversity, you see inclusion, you see great debate. Why aren't they making it to be TDs and senators? Why not? And the third thing I would ask is, for the, for the senators and the TDs out there and councillors, do you really have to run in the next election? Maybe give a spot to somebody else. Maybe consider that your cycle has run its course. We, I, in Galway County Council, for example, we have some people who've been county councillors for 18 years. I've never met them in my life at any community event, at anything. I'm telling you now, I want real leadership and I want real people elected. And those people can just stand down. Thank you for your service. We're very grateful, but things are moving on. The future. Ashley. Listen, thanks very much to our panel, everybody. Thank you. Could Mick rerun? At 1,250 votes, that's phenomenal. Are you running again? Please run again. I'll go yeah, on that's a yes, that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's an ambush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, thanks very much, everybody, and thanks for our questions. Paul and Mick. Thank you. Thanks very much, lads. Thank you.